Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to McLean Hospital Grand Rounds. Today is a crossroads in psychiatry um, where we are bringing together some researchers, uh, some who do basic science research and also clinically oriented research to discuss how research might inform clinical care. And the, the theme for today is focusing on the female depressive-like symptoms and increased vulnerability to initiate and maintain substance use disorders. For those of you who need uh, continuing education credit, the cloud CME code today is 584. So if you text that to the system, you will be registered. Um, so the first person that we're gonna hear from today is Dr. Marissa Silberi. She's a neuroscientist and the director of the Neurodevelopmental Laboratory on Addictions and Mental Health here at McLean oh. Hospital and an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She's conducted preclinical and clinical studies for over 25 years, examining alcohol and drug use and risk factors for addictive and other psychiatric disorders. She uses MRI to investigate neurobiology measured in conjunction uh, with cognitive ability and mood, anxiety and impulsivity across the lifespan and in healthy and psychiatric populations. She has had numerous funding sources and numerous awards, which I won't go into so that we can give her more time to speak. Unfortunately, her co-presenter, Dr. Elena Chartoff, um, is traveling right now. So she has recorded her presentation, but I'm gonna go ahead and introduce her now so that um, I don't have to do that in the middle of the presentation. Dr. Chartoff, for those of you who don't know, directs the Neurobiology of Motivated Behavior Laboratory in the Basic Neuroscience Division at McLean Hospital, and is also an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Her lab focuses on understanding mechanistic connections between negative emotional states and addictive behavior using laboratory rodent models. Throughout her research, she studies males and females in parallel to be sensitive to the biology-based sex differences in brain and behavior. And so now it is my pleasure to turn the grand rounds over to Dr. Silberi. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's good to see everyone, I guess. I wish I was seeing your faces in person. Um, it's always a pleasure to come and give grand rounds. Um, and uh, missing my co-conspirator, Dr. Chartoff. She's uh, put together a fabulous presentation and my job is to introduce from uh, 10,000 feet our topic, talk a little bit about clinical research in this regard, and uh, then hopefully transition you over to the uh, neuroscience portion of this talk. So as you see, our focus today is on the female, uh, how depression and other vulnerabilities figure into substance use disorders. Now, I will say that the only, um, I have no disclosures, except for the fact my personal disclosure is that I'm not a clinician. I don't play one on the TV. And I have been focused on clinical research for the last 20 years after a, a degree in neuroscience. But my public, uh, my, pub my public message is that I am pursuing a uh, master's in mental health counseling degree because at this point in my career, this is my existence shift in my interests, and it's really gone more towards treatment. All of my clinical colleagues at McLean have been so inspiring to me, and um, I feel like I'm one of those people that can think about the neuroscience all the way through the treatment. So thank you all for being a great inspiration to me. So, you know, when thinking about teenage girls, girls in general, what is their vulnerability? You know, we can think about what is the prequel to addiction? addiction. And I like this term because it's really thinking about, you know, looking at kids when they're young, how can we actually make predictions about, um, you know, identifying those at risk, those with vulnerabilities. And, you know, as my, um, as my studies as a counselor are increasing, and we think about case studies and how we bridge those with research, you know, here is a, what I like to call a tale from the trenches. This is the case of seven-year-old Mia. She is social. She has close friends. She loves music and gymnastics. She does well in school. She's smiling. She's young. So the question is, is there a prequel here? If you listen to some of her language, some of the things she says are, even at this young age, I'm not good at it. Am I annoying you? She says, my art was bad. I'm sorry. Um, I did something wrong. 
why are you telling me you can do it because you think I can't? And so we think about the language. My other disclosure is that is actually my daughter. Um, to hear her say these things that have a negative uh that are have a negative connotation is really how we start to think about um, addiction and what risk might be lingering. Um, I do have a video that I want to share, but to do that, I have to go out of PowerPoint for a second. So hopefully you can see this. This is a small clip from um, Partners uh, in Addiction. You know, I never thought we'd get to this point because we've been battling for years. We've been battling since our daughter was probably about 13 years old. She's 29. She was really twisted in it, and we just we just couldn't see our way uh, to her recovery for quite some time. My daughter went in for a checkup, had a cavity, had a pain, and was given Vicodin at 14. That just made all of her troubles and her pain go away. After Molly started on the Vicodin, we started on the next 14 years of being in and out of 20 rehabs, sober living homes, and outpatient programs. So as I'm sure you can appreciate, there have been many of these uh, types of vignettes that we've seen at McLean of case studies where we're trying to understand where was the transition. And so, you know, in the words of uh, one of my colleagues at Children's, Dr. John Knight, with a strong motivated family, a treatment system that sees to medication, psychiatric care and social supports, there's tremendous hope. And I think this is one of my favorite quotes is that no child has to be lost. And so, as we put all of these pieces together and we consider, well, what does drug use look like in girls versus boys? Is there really this increased risk? This is a survey that was published in 2019. This is looking at the prevalence of use of alcohol, the use of alcohol in a binge drinking pattern, uh, current opioid misuse and lifetime use. And the blue bars are girls. And what we see is that there's a significantly higher percentage of girls. Now, as you may know, there's actually been an evening out. It used to be the boys use more substances earlier on in life, but girls have really caught up. And interesting about this is there are some drugs that boys are, there's a higher prevalence, cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, injection, drug use. But by and large, if you think some of these significant differences of prevalence in girls using substances, this really helps us to outline the vulnerability. So how do we start to approach this idea? How can we understand the neurobiology, the you know, biomarkers of risk for who's uh, got the greatest vulnerability? As uh, in the introduction, I use brain imaging to be able to uh, look at the brain on a number of different dimensions. And by I, I mean myself and my fantastic team. And you know, if you think about what's exciting about this field is that you know, imaging can't provide you any information on this micro level, genes of protein, synaptic networks, neuronal networks. We really have this whole brain view of the brain. And, you know, we have this opportunity, especially in kids, because it's a non-invasive technology. We certainly don't want to, for the sake of science, expose kids to anything that's harmful for their brain. And so, you know, in the early 2000s, when I first arrived at McLean, there were not a whole lot of high powered scanners to be able to do this work. And it was only the beginning, you know, the dawning of the new era of looking at brain imaging in kids. And for one the other perks of MRI is that it's that you can study brains over and over again with no untoward effects. There have been amazing advances in terms of what we know about the adolescent brain. This is not, at this point, this is not new information. At the time that the information was first coming out, it was really, you know, earth shattering, so to speak, because what we want to know is how kids go from being these dependent uh, young children to these, you know, for all intents and purposes, functioning uh, kids that are going to be adults. And so I do a lot of community outreach and what the parents and staff and teachers and counselors want to know is so when do when does the brain actually become adult? And so based on our work, based on the work of many uh, people over the last two decades, there's been an explosion in research into the teenage brain. And 
you know, something that we've known for a long time, but is evidence-based now, is that the frontal lobe is the last part of the brain to come online. Uh, we know that where the executive functions come from is this part of the brain that's rapidly maturing, particularly during adolescence. And what executive functions give us that higher, you know, cortical level or cognitive level of abilities is, are things like in addition to attention and working memory, um, decision making, judgment, integration with uh, you know the emotional centers of the brain, and so we've come to have the evidence to show that the brain is rapidly developing. In ten years ago or so, we used to think about the brain on this very systems level, and some of the things we know now is that no part of the brain acts by itself. We know it is really, you know, this village perspective. There are several networks throughout the brain that yes, maybe the hippocampus is important for learning and memory. The frontal lobe is important for impulse control. The amygdala and the insula really manage some of the anxiety reactions. But what we really know is that no part of the brain acts alone. It is really this fantastic network of brain regions. And it's not just the frontal lobe developing in and of itself. It's not only the frontal lobe connecting, myelinating, prunings, being sculpted, but it's also the connections to other parts of the brain. And this is a really important advance in terms of what we know about how the brain is developing. And not surprising, some of the parts of the brain that are rapidly developing also happen to be parts of the brain that are really implicated in addictive disorders as well as other psychiatric disorders. So why study adolescence? Because we know that during adolescence, we see the initiation of substance use. We also see the onset of psychiatric conditions, depressive anxiety symptoms and other diagnoses. And so it kind of makes sense to look at the overlap of those regions to say, wow, by virtue of being an adolescent brain, there's already increased vulnerability. In some of the longitudinal work that my lab has been doing, we were looking at uh, adolescents recruited age 13 to 14 who were recruited as substance and uh, psychiatric diagnosis naive. And what we want to know is that could we predict from baseline who went on to initiate substances? One of the, also, one of the other pieces that we looked at and really a fit with our presentation today is that if you look at girls who are in the teal bars, what you see is that this is over time, this is a three-year longitudinal study, there is actually a significant increase in depressive symptoms measured using uh, the, the CESD, which is a measure of uh, depression in kids. And the dotted line represents the clinical threshold that's believed to indicate a clinical diagnosis. And you can see that the boys over the course of three years don't change. So what does that have to do with substances? What does that have to do with the brain? Well, again, if we look in brain and we take this network approach, one of the things we know is at the same time that the girls are showing this significant increase in depressive symptoms, we also see that there is a significant decrease in network strength in a region of the brain that really pulls together frontal lobe structures, hippocampus, amygdala. And so, you know, what does this mean? In terms of the brain network strength, this is not better or worse. This is different. This might be a neurobiological clue to us for systems to look at. These girls are not clinically depressed, but we want to follow to see where they go. And so if you take these two pieces together, we know depressive disorder and symptoms is an important part of the vulnerability. Um, we want to look at this relative to how substance use might be an increased vulnerability. Uh, one other thing just to point out, in this sample of over 80 kids, we found that after the baseline, um, the baseline visit, 45% of the girls went on to initiate substance use, alcohol, marijuana, nicotine, all of the above, whereas it was 41% in boys. And again, this is really in line with some of the epidemiologic data. And so let's understand the depressive symptoms in terms of how that might set girls up for increased um, vulnerability to substance use. Some of the exciting things that we're doing in the lab now and the things that we're thinking about is if we think about girls, we look at the studies and we're really focused on cisgender uh, heterosexual girls. One of the important things to think about as we really are evolving into a culture that is not quite there yet, but increasingly accepting of different gender identities, um, we have a long way to go, but also um, accepting of sexual orientation. 
And it's really stunning to me that there can be sex differences in terms of girls increasing in depression, showing differences in brain. At the same time, if we consider gender identity, which this is a sample from the ART, what we know is we looked at a study looking at gender diversity in uh, patients that were enrolled in the ART program. And what you see here is that from a sample of 200 kids, about 25% of the kids identified as being uh, having a diverse gender identity, either trans or non-binary, queer, otherwise. And so what we looked at, and for the purpose of this presentation, because we're talking about the female, girls who were born female, but who were identifying as boys of the sample, about a quarter of the sample, it was roughly 35 kids who identified as gender diverse. What we saw was about a quarter were trans boys. Now, of course, we would be remiss not to look at the kids who identify as non-binary, but just again, for the purpose of this presentation, it's not just sex, but it's gender differences already. And as you'll see in the elegant work by Dr. Chardoff, she is looking not females in the female sense of the word. Chromosomally, biologically, they are female. The work that we're learning about today is that you could be biologically female, you can transition to male, you can um, identify in a number of different ways and it has an impact. And so what you see here in the top row are the orange dots represent the kids who are transgender or gender diverse. And you could see that there were significant um, uh, health, mental health disparities with significantly greater levels of depression. As you can see in the top graph, that's what these represent. So at treatment entry and at treatment discharge, but interestingly, after treatment and a month out, they actually leveled off. We see a similar pattern in anxiety and emotion dysregulation. And I'll just point out for emotion dysregulation, you actually see that these significant differences are actually maintained all the way through follow-up. So what this tells us is that when we are studying sex differences, we need to make sure that we're including the sociological, you know, societal construct of what we know gender to be. We also see some really interesting patterns with uh, sexual orientation. These uh, data are also from the ART program, and this was looking at a subset of 66 girls who you know, were uh, born female. So looking, this does not include gender identity, but if you look at those who identify as a sexual minority, either lesbian, bisexual, other sexual orientation, then heterosexual, what you see is again, an interesting pattern. And so about 49% of our sample that we looked at in this girl cohort did identify that way. And you can kind of see, well, there's not so much a split between you know, depressive symptoms baseline to post, you see that everybody gets better. Obviously one of the perks of this um, amazing program, if you look at anxiety, you don't see a whole lot either. So in terms of sexual orientation, it is not so much the gender piece where you see these mental health disparities. However, if you look at emotion regulation, you see that not only do they start off with higher scores, I'm sorry about that, not only do they start off with higher scores, so here the sexual minority girls are in the blue, they start off, they catch up. So after two weeks of treatment, they look the same in terms of their emotion regulation, and even more so by the time they get out to follow up. So treatment, particularly in the domain of emotion regulation, is important, which ties these two things together. Substance use disorder also, if we think about co-occurring diagnoses, because often depression overlaps, right, with substance use disorders, as well as other psychiatric disorders. Um, in this sample from the ART, these are kids who, who had dual diagnoses, substance use disorders plus uh, pretty much everyone met criteria for major depressive disorder. And one thing I want to point out, because we are looking for risk factors in particular. And so one of the risk factors that really stuck out here is if you look in substance use disorder, uh, kids who meet the criteria, what you see is that there are significant differences in anxiety. So the gray bars represent um, normative samples of kids who have no diagnoses. And you can see that in general, they have low physical anxiety. Um, they have high harm avoidance, they have low social anxiety, about the same for separation anxiety. But really what bears, uh, I, you know, examining this in this data set is that in terms of physical anxiety, it's probably not surprising. Uh, kids that were SUD plus had significantly higher physical anxiety. So, you know, somatic, somatic uh, experiences, perhaps one of the reasons why they're using substances as a coping mechanism. 
but also you see that they have significantly lower harm avoidance. So here we have perhaps a personality or a temperament trait where they are less likely to avoid or less likely to avoid harmful situations. Chicken or the egg question, were they, har were they low in harm avoidance to begin with or uh, did it change as a factor of substance use? Either way, harm avoidance is something uh, that can be worked towards because certainly we can uh, increase harm avoidance. And that was one I'm not showing those data today. But over the course of treatment, there was a significant increase in harm avoidance in the substance use disorder group. So all of this is interesting. How do we take these data together? I've shown you data about depressive symptoms, anxiety, impacts of, uh, you know, girls having an increase in depression over time. There is a neurobiological component to this, which you know, all the studies I talked about in the ART are the kids who were looking for their prequel. We're trying to understand what about their profile, biological, clinical, um, cognitive, that actually shift them over into entering programs such as the ART or other clinical adolescent programs at McLean. Now the partial um, other types of programs that really focus on kids. And so how do we take those data and start to understand sex differences, gender differences, interactions between the two? And so I'm going to really transition us into Elena, uh, Dr. Chardoff's work, because there are things we wanna know about kids that just can only be answered by animal models. Uh, before I turn over to that, I wanna share just a couple more slides because we also wanna think about, you know, how can we disseminate this information? Is it surprising girls have an increase in depression symptoms? Probably not. Until you physically see the data, you don't know. What is new and novel is looking at brain network strength over the course of that same time course, following those kids longer. So the ACD study is a national, um, is a national consortium looking at kids, 10,000 kids over the course of 10 years, collecting all similar data. So we can actually follow that type of a trajectory. And we have the switch over into kids with substance use disorders. But how do we disseminate that information? We also know that depression and substance use disorders often co-occur, but what's the next step? And, you know, in my own personal work, one of my biggest passions is to talk to communities about translating these data into something that's usable and something I came across recently. And we have data to speak to this as well, um, and as do several others in McLean. How do we help? So I came across, um, you know, there's a very interesting article in the Times that is very uh, lay friendly. And so one of the concepts that comes up is the concept of self-efficacy. And not surprising, if you look at a measure of self-efficacy in the kids from the adolescent program, if you look at self-efficacy over time, you see similar patterns. So kids have lower self-efficacy in terms of their belief in their own ability to succeed, to regulate their thoughts, their emotions, their life, to cope. And so self-efficacy, and this was also shown by Dr. Greenfield and colleagues that, you know, women in a women only treatment group do better. They have better self-efficacy if they have same treatment. And so think about this for kids in some of the things that we're trying to apply to kids and help them have these protective factors, you know. Self-efficacy is really a foundation for resilience, grit, fortitude, perseverance. It gives them a sense of control, agency, hope, um, even when the world feels out of control. And so what do we see with low self-efficacy? This is really something that we can look at in girls. It's linked to pessimism, inflexibility, giving up, low self-esteem, uh, learned helplessness, depression. And so it is more likely that people with low self-efficacy, and I'd say people because girls, boys, trans girls, trans boys, um, non-binary individuals, really turning to drugs as a coping mechanism to alleviate bad feelings. And, you know, in the clip that I showed you, that's exactly what the parents were talking about is that, you know, prescription opioids was a way to dull their emotional pain. Um, this is an excellent book. You know, I have no, I have no connection to this person. The book is very user and public friendly. And so this is just a little small list of ways that parents 
or other adults and kids' lives can help to build some of this, you know, inoculation, as she says. Um, so I found that very interesting as well and fits. In the last piece of data, this is probably one of the most exciting things that we're doing in our lab and have been doing for a couple of years now, is looking at yoga as an intervention for depressive and anxiety symptoms. So we recruited kids who met criteria for depression. Um, they also had significant anxiety. You could see across this chart. So the bars in red are kids that met criteria for depression. They had higher symptoms across the board, more depressive symptoms, anxiety. They were riskier, higher state and trade anxiety, higher impulsivity. And so in work that we've been doing in collaboration with Kate McHugh, director of the fitness center and Helen Consiglio at Regis College, also a yoga practitioner and neuroscientist, what we saw that was interesting is in the first plot, you can see in the red bars, there was a significant decrease in depressive symptoms in our depressed kids over the course of four weeks, four short weeks of yoga twice a week and two homework sessions led to decreased depressive symptoms, which actually was maintained over the next four weeks of yoga. You also see it in anxiety. And I think the important point here is it was regardless of whether or not you met criteria for depressive disorder. So might yoga help bolster, you know, good mental health might help bolster, you know, reducing depressive symptoms. There was also an impact of one single acute yoga session. So after one session, and this is work that we're following up on in two ways. We currently have a study that we're gearing up for uh, recruiting uh, multiculturally diverse youth from inner city Boston, because we really want to understand culture. There are so many multicultural considerations for symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, as well as interventions. Are they less likely? Are there disparities in terms of willingness to pursue treatment? And so this is a really important area because yoga this is all virtual. It was an imaging study and we had to go virtual because of COVID. But what we wanted to be able to do is find something that has, you know, has empirical evidence to show that yoga is effective for helping kids feel better. And at the end of the day, that's the work that we're doing. We're trying to help kids feel better in their skin. So on the other side of the prequel is the sequel. So how do we go from, you know, healthy non substitute healthy to go into residential treatment around. Well, two of my favorite people who um, were kids, well, they were younger when they had significant substance use disorder issues, have gone women who have gone on to be very successful. And so, you know, what's the result, the consequence in the inference that's based on, you know, this prequel and then the sequel of having the substance use disorders. The good news here is that treatment can be successful. So you might have predisposing factors, you might have, you know, developed a use disorder, but at the end of the day, treatment can be very effective. And so the two individuals, one is Brené Brown, who's, who really suffered with addictions. She's been sober for 25 years. And, you know, hopefully most of you know who she is. She is a very, um, She's a researcher who looks at shame, vulnerability, and leadership. Also, Glennon Doyle, her case, she had addictions. Uh, she had bulimia beginning at age eight and also had a significant heavy pattern of alcohol use, binge, and blackout. Also sober for 18 years, has been in recovery for 18 years. And so, you know, what are our messages for kids? Vulnerability is not a weakness. Being able to identify how you feel, your emotions. You know, I tell my kids every day, your emotions are very important to me. And so my son said to my daughter today, um, why are you crying over a blanket? And I said, you know what? I said, some people have that reaction. It's not a bad thing to cry. We want to validate emotions and it fits in well with the depressive symptoms, initiation of substance use, a focus on emotion regulation. And, you know, my favorite quote, we can do hard things. So last piece, why, why we should consider sex and study sex differences in addiction research. This is where I want to transition over to Dr. Chardoff's talk, but essentially, you know, there are a lot of pieces here. There are sex differences in how people experience substances. These are things that we can't expose humans to without causing them harm. So we turn to very important preclinical models. And there's also socially gendered factors, which we cannot get to in animal models, but it helps us to start to identify uh, areas of research to back translate into um, the clinical studies. And it's not only important to look at sex and gender differences, 
we also have to consider what, what does it mean to have sex and gender sameness? Not that we failed to support a hypothesis, but the fact is that there might be some areas that don't have differences. So with that, I'm going to thank you for your, uh, for your time and your attention. I wish I could see all of your faces. I hope to see you in person sometime soon. And with that, I am going to end my presentation and hand it back over. Thank you very much. And thank you to my amazing lab, to my collaborators, colleagues, and to our <clears throat> funding sources. Thank you very much. Dr. Silberi, why don't I, uh, if you can, uh, we have at least one question typed in. Are there any, is there any information about specific types of yoga that are most therapeutic uh, in the interventions that you were talking about? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I was just in the process of writing back to the question asker. So the yoga that we used in our particular study, um, and if you really want the expert opinion, please uh, talk to Kate McHugh in the fitness center, but it was a modified Iyengar type of yoga. It's not to say that this is the best yoga for kids necessarily, but we had chosen this uh, modified version because this was based on work that I collaborated with some investigators from BU. So again, we're now working with some um, yoga investigate some yoga practitioners along with Kate and Dr. Consiglio to figure out what is the best yoga and what is, what can we package for kids to be able to do in their living room? Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Ideally being able to do yoga via virtual zoom really can help, um, you know, think about embarrassment, uh, willingness to want to perform yoga, but can't, but, um, I see that, uh, Marge is ready. So I'm going to, uh, I'll try to answer other questions in the chat as well. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Hello. Um, I, today I'm going to be talking, um, about preclinical studies, uh, to follow, uh, up from work done by Marissa, um, so we're focusing on the female, depressive-like symptoms and increased vulnerability to initiate and maintain substance use disorders. And like I said, I'll be talking about um, uh, preclinical studies. So for disclosures, uh, I, just, I serve on the scientific advisory board of a biotech company, Cerevel, and also have a sponsored research agreement with Cerevel. Uh, none of that work will be talked about today. So, what I'm showing here is uh, data from um, 2015 to 2019 from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Uh, and this is a paper from our uh, people here, uh, Dr. Kate McHugh and uh, Dr. Shelley Greenfield, among others. And what this is showing is that um, in the past year, uh, what people reported is that about 0.5% of the population uh, of females, of, of girls, um, had opio opioid analgesic use disorder. Um, so this particular data point uh, highlights that in adolescence, at least, the trend um, is that females have a greater prevalence of opioid use disorder than males. However, as people get older beyond adolescence, the trend flips so that uh, males have a higher prevalence of opioid use disorder uh, with uh, opioid analgesics than females. So this kind of, of data and analysis suggests and is consistent with a, a lot of evidence for gender differences in not just substance use disorder, but in opioid use disorder in particular. Another um, study asked the question, uh, among other things, is what drives or what are the characteristics of um, men and women who uh, have substance use disorder, specifically opioids, and what drives or what are the factors that contribute to their opioid use disorder. So what can be seen in this particular study is that uh, 
women are prescribed opioids more than men, or at least obtain their opioids from a prescription more than men. Um, and then below the in the red box, what you can see is that women report greater cravings than men, and also report that they use opioids to cope with both pain and negative affect more than men. So again, consistent with uh, gender differences in opioid use disorder. So before starting on the preclinical studies, which um, our goal is to determine if there are biological determinants for these gender differences, are there sex differences in substance use disorder or opioid use disorder? I uh, just wanted to go over that it's important to realize that sex differences can occur in a variety of ways, and I've tried to illustrate that here. So if you have a, a stimulus, uh, for example, this banana peel, which is, you know, the old slip on a banana joke, you can have different scenarios. You can have men and women, males and females, who have the same behavioral output, and the brain mechanisms that lead to this behavior can also be the same. No sex differences. You can also have the scenario where the behavioral responses to this stimuli are different and the brain mechanisms underlying these different behaviors are also different. An interesting and uh, one that one you really need to keep in mind is that you can have the same behaviors in males and females, with both Marge and Homer finding this joke hilarious, but the underlying brain mechanisms can be different. And this is important to understand these different options, and there are certainly others, it's, this is not exhaustive, that uh, when thinking about mechanisms and drug development for treatments, just because uh, behavioral response is the same doesn't mean that how the brain uh, creates that behavior is, is the same. So treatments might need to be different. So the work that we're doing in my lab is uh, trying to understand the behavioral responses to opioids in particular in addictive like models and ultimately uh, the neurobiological brain mechanisms underlying them. So a good framework to uh, discuss this work is from a paper, a review paper by George Kube. And he has this graphic that outlines basically the addictive process uh, with initial drug taking shown here in pink as being rewarding and illustrating that positive reinforcement drives initial drug taking. Again, this is a, a, a theory, but uh, the, there's lots of evidence supporting this. And then as uh, con drug use continues, as one progresses from drug misuse or abuse to uh, substance use disorder, you have the emergence of uh, negative effective states, withdrawal-like states, such that the motivation to continue taking drugs is driven by negative reinforcement. During this escalating and compulsive drug use, dependence develops, and dependence on drugs of abuse is characterized by a withdrawal syndrome when drug use is uh, stopped. In almost all cases of substance use disorder, people attempt uh, abstinence, they attempt to stop taking drugs, and during protracted or, or different lengths of abstinence, uh, unfortunately, there's uh, uh, extremely high rates of relapse. And again, this particular theory is that the negative reinforcement processes drive this. So a person is driven to take to relapse because they want to get rid of the negative effective states of drug withdrawal. So what I'll be talking about is based on this diagram, testing discrete phases in this progression of addictive-like processes in both male and female rats. So we'll talk about some work do, that we've done with acute oxycodone reward, and then 
work done with escalation of oxycodone intake using the self-administration paradigm combined with abstinence and relapse-like behavior. So the first uh, study is the acute oxycodone effects and comparing male and female responses. And I'll typically have this cartoon to, to highlight which phase of the addiction cycle I'm talking about. So here there is the acute rewarding effects. So this work on the left uh, was done by Jess Babb. Um, and what she did is she treated rats with oxycodone in the place conditioning paradigm. And this Pavlovian test, uh, one pairs a drug with a particular with a context um, in the place conditioning apparatus. And upon um, testing in a drug-free state, which side of the place conditioning apparatus the animal prefers to go to, you can determine um, uh, whether the, the uh, drug was rewarding or aversive. And what you can see here is that both males in the blue bar and females in the yellow bar during the test showed a uh, robust place preference. So they formed a, re a rewarding association between the place conditioning apparatus, particular side and oxycodone. There's no difference between males and females. So the behavior is the same. But in a separate study, uh, Raj Desai, uh, who we're collaborating with, he used microdialysis, which uh, is shown here in the upper right as um, microdialysis probes are implanted into the nucleus accumbens shell or core. And these are brain regions that are critical for re reward processing. Um, and he measured uh, dialysis, he uh, recovered um, extracellular fluid at different time points after injection of oxycodone. And what you can see is that if you look at basal percent basal dopamine output in the nucleus accumbens shell, first, at, under vehicle conditions, females have uh, more extracellular do dopamine compared to males. And in response to cumulative dosing of oxycodone, you see a striking different sex difference in dopamine output. However, this is not observed in the um, nucleus accumbens core. Excuse me. So what you can see here is this is an example of where the behavioral response to acute oxycodone in the place conditioning paradigm, at least, is the same between males and females, whereas the uh, underlying brain mechanisms, which most likely uh, require dopamine, are different in males and females. So our next study or our next goal was to determine um, if there are sex differences in oxycodone self-administration, specifically in the escalation of oxycodone intake when the animals are given long access to the drug. And if there, we also wanted to see if there were differences in um, the negative effective states during abstinence and Q-induced reinstatement, which is uh, akin to relapse in male and female rats. So the experimental schematic is shown here in this cartoon, which I'll, I'll show multiple times. And the basic idea is that the same rats were uh, allowed to do self-administration of oxycodone. So they were implanted with jugular catheters and trained to do oxycodone self-administration. And the same rats also had um, ICSS electrodes implanted in their um, brains in a particular brain region in order to measure uh, reward sensitivity, specifically oxycodone withdrawal induced anhedonia. So this uh, work was done, led by a postdoc in, in my lab, Shimon Guha, and particular 
uh, help from research assistants Nick Constantino and Jillian Driscoll to uh, conduct this work. So what uh, they found is in the self-administration paradigm, in panel A, what you're measuring, what we're, what we're showing is total oxycodone infusions per session. And there was one session per day. So you can see that male and female rats will self-administer oxycodone when they're allowed uh, one hour per day. And this amount stays very stable and does not increase over time. On day nine, we switched the um, time for the rats, so now they have six hours per day. So this is a long access paradigm. So of course they infuse more drug in six hours, but they also escalate their intake. So the amount infused on day nine here is significantly different from the amount infused on day 22. And that's actually shown in um, panel C is the escalation of intake. Now, despite the separation between male and female rats, uh, there is not a significant sex difference um, measured either by a two-way ANOVA here or um, when comparing uh, total infusions between males and females. And um, that's summarized below here. After this long access self-administration, when the rats escalate, both male and female rats escalate their intake of drug, we put them through a two week forced abstinence in which they basically were left in the animal facility. Um, they did have daily ICSS behavior done, but they did not go through any self-administration. After these 14 days, we brought them back to the self-administration chambers and did a reinstatement test. And in this test, the rats are placed in the, in the self-administration chambers and provided the same cues as before, but any press on the active lever no longer administers drug. So uh, there's no consequence of pressing on the active lever. So the data that we got is shown up here in these, in these um, graphs. So individual rats are shown in the, in the dots and the squares. And you can see that on the last day of self-administration, day 22, there was a certain um, level of active lever pressing among the rats. And then on the relapse test after the abstinence period, that pressing on the active lever is increased significantly. This is true for both females and males. And just for a uh, comparison, a control being rats that self-administered saline for the, um, for the 22 days of self-administration, you can see that they do not have a significant increase in drug seeking or active lever pressing in the relapse test. So the question that uh, remains here is, how does reward sensitivity change during the long access oxycodone self-administration and abstinence? And this again is measure, measured by the ICSS, intracranial self-stimulation. So an important term to define for those uh, not clear of the preclinical meaning uh, decreased reward sensitivity is operationally defined as anhedonia. So stimuli that previously had high reward value now have reduced reward value and are less reinforcing, meaning that the animal is less willing to work to obtain that um, uh, brain stimulation reward or stimulus. So in this part of the experiment, we're now focusing on the intracranial self-stimulation behavior that was conducted throughout the experiment. This 
by doing ICSS or intracranial self-stimulation throughout the experiment, we can actually measure reward sensitivity, increases and decreases in reward function in real time throughout the self-administration of oxycodone. Now to highlight um, how we go about this, I've generated this sort of hypothetical cartoon showing that um, as we showed acute oxycodone, like in the place conditioning, will increase reward. Uh, and then I showed you in the self-administration where they're self-administering oxycodone every day, what we predict is happening is that uh, as time goes on during those 14 days of self-administration, the drug high slowly decreases and the emergence of anhedonia appears sort of uh, akin to like a daily withdrawal uh, syndrome. And to highlight this more specifically, if you look uh, at this red dot here, this hypothetically indicates when the ICS, sorry, when the IVSA begins. So you can see that there's an increase. Once the animal starts self-administering oxycodone, there's an increase in reward. And then when the oxycodone self-administration is over and the drug has uh, worn off, now the um, animal starts to become, um, withdrawal kicks in and anhedonia emerges down here. And at this point is when we're measuring ICSS to, to measure that anhedonia. And in our particular experiment, the time between the end of IVSA and the ICSS measurements of anhedonia is two hours. So the data that we found is shown here. And what's important to know for these for these graphs is that anything that you, any data points above 100% um, is considered anhedonia, a reduction in reward sensitivity. So ICSS thresholds measured at baseline are considered 100%. During the short access oxycodone self-administration, which we're calling training, there's no change in reward sensitivity in ICSS. However, during the long access of oxycodone self-administration, when we measure ICSS two hours after each day's IVSA, what you can see is that the, um, the emergence of anhedonia in both males and females. The pattern might be slightly different, but the, um, there's a significant increase in um, ICSS thresholds compared to baseline. What is really striking is that during the abstinence period, when the animals are no longer getting uh, drug, females, the anhedonia in females persists for the entire abstinence period, whereas the males return to baseline um, and, and certainly uh, bounce around, but the, the female response is clearly a maintenance of um, anhedonia. So this here suggests a behavioral sex difference in the response to um, chronic oxycodone self-administration and withdrawal. The big question, of course, is whether that anhedonia that we see during long access self-administration, during the daily withdrawal periods, or the um, anhedonia that persists in females during abstinence contributes or plays any role, has a causal effect on reinstatement of drug seeking. So if you think back to the clinical story where women report of taking uh, prescription opioids to relieve uh, negative affective states, the idea here would be that female rats would relapse or be seeking drug 
in order to reduce the uh, anhedonia during abstinence. So um, what Shimon did with this data is cor correlation, taking the anhedonia score during abstinence, so the data shown here in this left panel, and correlating it with the um, active lever presses that the rats did during the relapse test. And there was a significant correlation, meaning that the higher the anhedonia score, or the more anhedonia, the more the rats will press the active lever. When he broke this data down into male and female, uh, what you can see is based on the statistics that the significant correlation is really driven by females. So the male rats, um, there is not a significant correlation between anhedonia and um, relapse active lever pressing. So this is consistent with the human literature, but um, certainly it is correlation is not causation, so more work needs to be done. So in summary, what I've shown um, is a sort of snapshot of some of the work that we're doing, looking at um, comparing male and female behavioral and neurobiological effects to oxycodone. So we've um, observe that overall male and female rats show similar oxycodone self-administration and relapse behavior. And that anhedonia emerges in both male and female rats during the long access oxycodone self-administration as they escalate their oxycodone intake. But that anhedonia persists in females but not males during abstinence. And Finally, that anhedonia during abstinence positively correlates with the magnitude of Q-induced reinstatement, or which is a model for, for relapse in females, but not males. And so uh, our current and future goals are to get at the neurobiology, the underlying mechanisms uh, for the progression of the addiction process in both males and females. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, my lab. Um, everybody played a role in one way or the other, in particular, Shimon Guha, the postdoc who uh, I showed a picture of, um, research assistants Jillian, Megan, uh, David Potter, um, and others. And I'd like to thank our funding as well. Okay, thank you very much. So that takes us right to one o'clock. And I know um, Dr. Silveri has been diligently answering people's questions in the chat. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up, but I just wanna um, thank Dr. Chartoff from far away and uh, thank Dr. Silveri for um, amazing presentations and really interesting, highly relevant information to what we do in practice. So thank you all. And uh, we will see you hopefully next week for Grand Rounds again.